Um, Clickety clack, typewriter opening, machinery, steampunk, gears, telephones, double zero dice. Way we go. Ticky talk, ticky talk, ticky talk, sticky talk, sticky talk, troubles in paradise, methodology, creationism, Rude James County, Tortuga, and WordPress.com. Okay, uh, there we've got our um, potential show going here. I put a link out to Jackson on uh, Twitter, which um, uh, depends on circumstances. He uh, said he may or may not be able to come, and we'll find out whether or not if he drops into the stream at some point, uh, we will be happy to do so. Let me also Okay, uh, we seem to dump for a bit. Um, we seem to have no indication that there's any live chat floating along. There seemed to be a menu that has disappeared. So um, uh, what was happening automatically last time I was on isn't happening now. So I have no idea whether anybody's in the live chat or not because I don't see that scrolling up um, as yet in the chat window. And supposedly I have to activate a channel in the menu I tried to get to. Uh, wasn't active. So I'm just winging it here for the moment. I'd sent a uh, link to Jackson earlier, and um, that was to the previous time I started up. So that may be invalid now. I haven't sent a refresh one. So uh, we're uh, basically winging it here. Uh, we'll do a really fast show then, just in case we glitch up again. Uh, let me thank the tendril. Colton, new Colton. He's our 30th patron. Thank you, Colton. Uh, Eric Rowley, Speed of Sound, Service and Zeshi, Travis Adams, Ian Chen, Convert Me, Stephen Early, Eat Neal, James Fitzwater, History Minor, Ralph McFadden, Paula Gia, Benjamin Simpson, 
The wrong Totus Real, Christopher Johnson, Daniel, Steve Bauman, Barry Gale, Beddoes, Insects Are Cool, Kevin Miranda, Reeves, Morton, Nielsen, Paul, the Skeptic, Couple Uppies, Bo Hobo, Wes Moosen, Alex Stone, and Paul Williams. And I will also uh, thank our legacy patrons who helped at one point or another. Uh, Jen, Jody, Mike, John, Keith, Andrew, Dyer, Yui, Mona, Brad, Daniel, Nanya, Staggles, Sun, Sky, Stones, Ugly Drill, Montrose, Everett, Vince, and uh, uh, Sewer. Uh, all of you who have been very, very helpful at one time or another. And uh, I will not forget you on that. So uh, this is a clumsy show because we don't have that stupid um, uh, channel information um, available. I'm going to have to probably figure out how to get that little menu. It, this is new. It wasn't having a problem before. Uh, so uh, it's always nice when something that does things the one time you do it doesn't do it the same way the second time you do it. Uh, anyway, uh, part one is the continuing saga of replacing Darwin, uh, going through its source material because uh, Nathaniel Jensen neglected to actually assemble a bibliography or index for anything, so you have no idea what he's citing. Uh, this chapter number four is on biogeography, and I'll show you a pretty little picture here of the level of illustration we have in his book right here. So we got a little section on the biogeography here. Everything's backwards, trying to figure out how things work on screen. And it's straightforward, uh, relatively lot of thinly sparse and illustrated. Uh, if you're going to bring up biogeography, you should jolly well deal with biogeography. So at the moment, uh, we're dealing with Madagascar, which is the cute little island off of Africa in the Indian Ocean, and is a beautiful hotbed of information about how forms of life can show up on the island, and plus what happened was living on it before it separated from the mainland, uh, and um, gradually modify into specialized forms, among which are a pile of lemurs. So Jensen um, just simply uh, uh, dangles the point that a hundred of Madagascar species are primates, terrestrial mammals, without an obvious means to cross the 250 miles of water separating the island from the mainland. Did he look? Uh, because there are a variety of technical papers on the subject that appeared before the book came out in 2017 that he might have drawn on. And I don't know yet, even if he's ever going to pay attention to that, because remember, he doesn't have a reference bibliography, so we can't see what's in there or not. Anyway, I've, I'll be putting a link up in the video description once I get that out of the way of um, Brian Twitek's uh, 2010 Surf's Up, How Rafting Lemurs Colonized Madagascar. And that was relating to uh, a paper by Ali and Huber on mammalian biodiversity on Madagascar controlled by ocean currents uh, that had appeared. And there's a uh, research gate link that I'll get so you can follow up on that as well. Basically, that little itty bitty critters that are the migrating lemurs that have yet to diversify into the forms we see on the island aren't as so difficult to get across as you might think. And uh, then there's also a pair of papers from um, 2012 in Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences by Cortini and Summons uh, that went further to explore how the actual endemic fauna uh, there got to be the way they are. So there's a lot of technical literature just that even on a quick scan that you could theoretically have found, and yet Jensen isn't bringing all of that up, and that would mean that you would have specific data as to what animals are there and what characteristics they have and whether or not a flood explanation is any better as a model because was Madagascar an island pre-flood? Did it become an island only post-flood? Did the critters that were on there exist on the ark in the form they are now? All of that's implied by his model. And um, if he had a model, and yet that's not what we're getting here. We're getting just a little dangly bits along. I know by the end of the chapter, he's waving some creationists in his footnote at us. Uh, Kurt Wise and others, and we'll be getting to that in weeks to come. But in betwixt, it's all a bunch of generic things. This, uh, Some of the stuff he gets from Encyclopedia Britannica, uh, Wikipedia, and other sources that are just generic. Uh, and um, uh, given the fact that there is technical literature on this subject, there ought to be something. Uh, so, uh, oh, gosh, I wish I could see if anybody was watching the show or not. I no idea if anybody is. <clears throat> and um, uh, I can probably try as a sneaky thing to see whether or not um, I can get uh, Jackson in here to find out if I need to get a new uh, message in here. And I'll try to get um, put it up and send him that message, see whether or not that works. 
and we'll find out whether that's happening. Um, anyway, um, the uh, other half of the show, which depending on the length of the show, maybe half or not, uh, it relates to um, uh, a, a wacky little fellow that got listed to me uh, from um, uh, on Twitter about uh, this fellow Brian Ford and his aquatic dinosaur theory. If you haven't heard about Brian Ford's aquatic dinosaur theory, don't be surprised because it's completely wrong. But anyway, it's not the idea that some dinosaurs could swim on certain occasions. I don't think there was any real argument about that, that uh, theropods might have been fairly good swimmers. And we know some that were pacivorous in lifestyle, like the uh, baryonics in, in Britain, um, that um, kind of like a Kodiak bear going after the um, salmon. And um, uh, sauropods may even have done not floating on occasion, but were they all coming from an entirely aquatic environment? They didn't live on the land at all. Well, this hasn't set well with actual paleontologists. And there's a, a rather amusing um, post uh, from, um, uh, um, let's see who, yeah, 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 yeah. oh, yes, Ian Nage uh, from 2015, where he went through point by point why his argument was just terrible. <laughs> And no one was paying any attention to it. I'll be putting all the links up on that. Ford, uh, as you'll be able to see from the video that Ford put up in 2020, um, he's a real prickly guy. And his main area is microscopes and particularly the history of microscopy. And he um, has often been embroiled in just a testy uh, affair because uh, some of uh, Van Leeuwenhoek's early microscopes, uh, he had taken some pictures through them from the actual microscopes uh, in the um, uh, 1980s and um, was the first to do so. Well, along in the 21st century come people who have gone back to the museum material and used high definition photography to do that. And they were they made the mistake of saying, ah, this is the first time we've done that with high definition equipment. And they weren't alluding to Ford's 1980s works. And he just went piss at hysterical over this. He's just been furious at, at how he's taking umbrage at every possible person who fails to mention that he had taken these photographs back in the 1980s. So he's a, a, a prickly contrarian sort, um, very witty and, and intense, um, as the um, uh, video that you'll uh, look into will have. It's, I, I think somebody from Russia or somebody is, is interviewing him. And uh, it's... Um, as credulous as you do in standing for truth, uh, dealing with uh, young earth creationists. Let me see how, let me dash on over to our little Twitter here and find out whether or not um, I can find what I know here. Let's try again. May or may not be the same stream. And um, again, I have no idea whether Jackson is actually home this time to deal with that, but I have put the link up on there and then I can shut down uh, Twitter to save on my little laptop memory and um, we'll see what happens. Uh, so anybody out there in um, uh, video land that's actually watching this, I, I'm unable to pay the slightest attention to what's in the live chat because I'm not getting that feed coming up through um, uh, the process in here. All of this examples of Jensen and Ford um, and all the background work that I'm doing, uh, prepping up for Rocks Were There Too with Jackson and all of the jousting that you see me doing on Twitter, uh, all has to do with this methods issue of how do you build an argument and how do you investigate what sources are valuable, what data are you going to pay attention to? And uh, if you're Paying attention to it and using sound method, you can make an argument that may end up being wrong, but at least you're doing it in good faith. Uh, what we're bumping into with Jensen in creationism and Brian Ford uh, in this aquatic dinosaur model is not bad faith per se, but bad method. Uh, selective reporting um, and personality issues, uh, which you definitely get in with Brian Ford. Uh, and ideological issues, which is what we're getting into in Jensen. And if anything, probably the most annoying thing about reading the semi-scientific 
books like Replacing Darwin. And the same thing happened with Reuben Sanford's uh, 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 Bones of Contention, is they're hide the ball. They don't really reveal their young earth creationist dogma much at all. And even at that, only way down at the end of the story, rather than coming out plainly and saying what their position is and making it as easy as possible for you to investigate whether they have a sound argument or not. And that, that annoys me. Just say what you think, figure out what you think. And that, of course, it can be argued is going to be one of the major problems with uh, creationism and the aquatic dinosaur model is that you're never going to be able to make all the data fit. So watching all of that, um, as a general rule, when you're approaching anybody internet, you see it with dealing with Trumpistas and anti-vaxxers and people who don't like wearing masks for COVID and people who think the earth is flat and people who think all sorts of oddball stuff, is you're looking at what evidence are they offering? Have they really thought thought through the model that they're proposing, all the implications of it. Um, have they worked out standards of evidence for changing their mind? Um, do they show a propensity to fact check carefully? You can find a small cadre of almost embryonic non-Tortugans in, um, in creationism and in other areas, but certainly in creationism. They're ones that actually do sort of fact check stuff at a very narrow limit. Uh, Todd Wood does that now and then. And you find some people who get into um, critical um, uh, issues regarding accelerated radioactive decay and, and a lot of technical issues that occur in young earth creationism, um, who will pointedly note that, oh no, that point you're trying to raise doesn't fit the actual facts within that little narrow thing. They still are operating on a field where the big flood must still be happening. They don't ever disagree on those things, but they can nitpick over the fine tuning areas. And even though that's actually undermining the entire argument, they just don't get that far to realize it. You don't find much of anything in that same mode going on over at intelligent design land, uh, in part because it's a way smaller field. There are fewer people. Um, uh, there's at least 50 or so active um, fact claimant disputants in young earth creationism uh, nursing around where there's only about a dozen in intelligent design and they downplay inconveniences and differences and they have even less of an, a stab at models than young earth creationists do. I keep on looking over at that chat window and thinking that I'm going to see something pop up in there. <laughs> yeah, sorry. Oh, that's annoying. And I will have to work out why that's the case. Um, and uh, given the fact that it can be a little awkward on the video things, I'll probably uh, I'll try towards the end of the show to put the uh, rocks for their uh, blurb uh, up for uh, the book. Isn't it a wonderful idea that you can use for your holiday gift giving? The books. There we go. Behind my shoulder here and whoop, up there. Uh, the rocks were there and evolution slam dunk and the paralogs of Phileas Fogg that covers science and fiction. And uh, you can get them on Amazon. There'll be links uh, to uh, the main science books. I've never put a link up to Paralogs um, up on uh, the thing because that's outside of the venue of this particular project. But still, you can get them. Look around my name on Amazon. And you can find out about that. So uh, they're 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 delightful gifts. They make excellent doorstops because they're fairly massive, especially the rocks were there. Uh, that one's a hefty little puppy. And um, um, they will be material that you will have seen nowhere else, and they have um, documentation that they'll pull together. Um, Evolution Slam Dunk um, pulls together all the material on the reptile mammal transition. We'll allude to um, some of the updates on the matter in uh, Rocks 2 because there have been some new attempts to slam into the reptile mammal transition from a creationist point of view, basically repeating the same claims over and over and over. Uh, there'll be a lot of material on that. It's amazing how much science uh, and, and creationism, for that matter, can be accumulating in a matter of a couple years to where there's an awful lot of new points that you can uh, draw on. And, uh, and that's fun to do. Uh, so um, in subsequent weeks, of course, I'll be continuing and moving into the later chapters when we start getting into the nitty gritty genetic stuff. 
uh, that's actually the meat of uh, the, it's way down the line towards the tail end of the book. There, um, Jensen is actually making specific claims about individual uh, families of organisms and arguing that they are occurring all within the post-flood period. So they're 4,500 years or less. And what I, I'm going to be fascinated is to try to ferret out where the hell he thinks he's getting his date from on this. The, the notes are positively chock block with links, I think, to um, data fields that he stored maybe online. And I haven't dived into it. I haven't bothered to, to focus on it too closely because I'm going to get to it down when he gets to it. Because if, he's, if it's at a particular website, then um, I need to know about that information and it's not easily accessible. Um, often these kinds of data things really do depend on looking at the original data sources to find out where he's drawing his material from. Uh, some of his little charts, as we'll be seeing, are loony in that they seem to imply certain kind of taxa like deer are showing up in historic times. I mean, you know, this is in the... the uh, almost down to the times of, of you know the Assyrians and Romans that, that what these new species are popping up in. Uh, and it, it's um, a strange bit, but he all basically is just crunching everything into that, that 4,500 year time frame. Um, then um, uh, there will be linkages to various video debates uh, in uh, subsequent weeks as we move through December into January. Depending on, oops, oh, seems to have one of your students having connection issues, so we may or may not be back online again. That's why I wanted to get as much out of the way as possible. I will continue talking during the operation and um, because there's nothing more depressing than, than dead air. If um, it happens that um, the, uh, the signal actually drops out, you won't hear any of that. So it'll just jump from one point to the next. Uh, I'll probably if we get back online and if it restores the connection on here, I'll probably go ahead. Matter of fact, I should probably go ahead and get uh, the rocks for their promo set up as we go. There we go. And get that all right now. So we'll be all set to throw that in. There we go. Seemingly, we're back online on that. Let me share screen and put up the cheap link to promo. There we go. And right there. And let us go and let us play that out. The uh, You're not hearing the sound, although I am. Um, that's a jaunty little tune that Peter put to it. Uh, the Rocks were there. Uh, Jackson and Weed and I uh, collaborated on this work. We're very proud of it. It's a thick work of 900 pages with 4,500 references. It's um, uh, fully indexed uh, with a mass of delightful material on geology and biology and the origin of birds and elements about human evolution and uh, so many other subjects that pop up. Uh, Steve Bauman, who's one of the supporters of the channel, uh, did vetting on the geology work. Um, neither one of us are geology people, and yet um, we're very careful in our research and we wanted to make sure everything was as uh, solid as possible. So if you have a sound method, you can clearly um, deal with technical literature at any level. And um, Jackson, of course, is a biology student at college. He's about ready to get his um, uh, BA, BS uh, there. And um, I have a BA in history, uh, just a, um, a Layman's interest in fascinating stuff and science and all the rest, but uh, both of us practice sound source methods. So you find out what a topic is, you research what you can about the field, you get up to speed on things, you find out what the um, standard view is, are there any idiosyncratic views, uh, and where does the creationist fall in the landscape? Uh, do they offer a model? Uh, how seriously are they taken? <laughs> That's the, they're never taken seriously. There's no, literally no example of a creationist concept, whether it's catastrophic plate tectonics or uh, genetic entropy, uh, which um, we'll be getting some additional material in. Um, we covered quite a lot of it in uh, volume one of the rocks were there, uh, particularly in relation to um, um, 
both Samford, Jenskin, Tompkin, Tompkin, Carter, and company. And they're basically doubling down on this argument. They just put up a posting just a, a few days ago uh, at uh, Creation Ministries International insisting that all the critics who are dumping on them, including Dan Stern, Cardinale, and others, are just wrong. They're just wrong. Well, sorry, but um, a genetic entropy ain't a thing. And it has zero predictive value, which is why nobody in the regular genetics community uh, pays attention to it. Um, the idea that a model could be so fabulously good that nobody who works in the field other than your little club pays attention to it um, is an indication that maybe your model isn't actually accurate. In the same way that flood geology isn't used by oil companies when they go to find oil and resources because it doesn't work. <laughs> and it's a waste of money, a waste of time. Um, and uh, the people who are actually in the business of doing stuff financially uh, want to make sure that things are operational you know, that way. Uh, well, um, we have not received uh, Jackson uh, popping in here. It could be that he was uh, busy and not able to uh, come and or the linkage may or may not work. Uh, we're coming up close on the half an hour. So even though this is a truncated show, um, I will uh, kind of riff for the remaining part. I will stay on as long as the show goes for about another half hour if necessary so that we actually have an evolution hour. I'll try to bring up material about what's in the works uh, for um, uh, subsequent time frames and what to do also about well, I think maybe best to go on about what the network should be in terms of science defense. So everybody who's watching me, who connects up with anybody else who might or might not want to watch me, and any people that you're watching on other channels and networks, whether it's Apologia or Aaron Ra or um, Vice Rhino or uh, Dapper Dino or anybody else that, that falls in any venue, let everybody know about all of what we're doing and the primacy of the source methods approach. Um, there are a couple things that I think are valuable for doing stuff online. One is always get your facts straight. Two, if you can do it with fancy graphics, and uh, that's it, Gibbon, Erica does delicious material and screen shares and all this kind of stuff. Jackson does uh, videos where uh, rather than just a live chat like this, he, he's doing uh, targeted material with visuals and all that stuff. Uh, and the thing that, that I definitely want to hit home is give links to the science sources. Don't bother about secondary sources unless they're really good as an explanation, like I'm I'm going to be doing there with the Brian Switek or the Darren Nash. They're they're excellent explainers. Uh, and it's not some little short squib, it's a good sized discussion. Um, otherwise, if it's a technical paper and you're just linking to the abstract, maybe not. Um, consider not doing that or put just the basic, if you, when you get down to like two or three pages of linkages, that can be very intimidating. Um, uh, but focus, if you can, on core material that is just really critical uh, of the case. And um, uh, that is uh, the, the primary source material that makes the most impact and that is available open access. You'll have the best of luck if you can get proceedings to the National Academy of Sciences because everything in it is open access after a year. And an awful lot of the cutting edge papers are often open access from the get go. Uh, much, but not all, of science and nature papers will be available somewhere open access. Uh, the professors involved uh, are posting them on their websites or they're loading them up on uh, academia.edu or ResearchGate, something like that. There you can put the links in, and I do the same thing over here. Uh, papers that are not ex accessed through their official website, but through downloading of it. It uh, doesn't matter. Whatever the way you can put it up, the better. And so what you want is to triage so that you have a, a tightly packed evidential argument it's documented by easily accessible core material that makes your best case. Don't worry about secondary material. Think about what your best case is for the position and proceed accordingly. And that way you make it easy for people that are watching the video to do follow-up work because they can hit on a thing that they don't have to hunt around to get a, a, a primary link on. It's right there. And they can download it. They can read it at their leisure. And they can do what other uh, exploration that they want to do 
uh, as they will. Uh, this is, a, a, now we're into the procedure of how to do it rather than the content of what you're doing. Um, I participated in some of the vetting uh, and, and preparation that uh, people have done for debates with creation. And there, the important issue is uh, for the debater to give a presentation of what they're going to present so that you can see how well the argument goes. And then also uh, the debate prep helpers uh, improving their game by bringing up issues and information that may or may not, they may not have thought about. And so they can keep those in reserve if they want to use them, or they can even make it part of their direct uh, presentation if they really feel impressed by it. But all of that is about upping the game. And so if anybody wants uh, to debate a creationist, uh, they need to be prepared in two ways. One is to know what your own position is, grounded at primary source level to the best of your ability. And two, know what your opponent's position is and grounded at their source level to the best of your ability. So you basically will know their argument as well or better than they are. And you will know the criticisms of them and you will know the science information that you have, and you will know whether or not they've actually even addressed those sorts of things. That allows you to target discussion questions to expose the reasons why the other person's position is not in fact a valid one, because they don't have an accurate model, they can't explain um, uh, relevant data, uh, maybe they can't even explain the data they think they can explain. Uh, a lot of examples, of, of just ridiculously unconvincing hoaxes and fakery goes on in the bottom feeder level of creationism uh, from Biloxi River man tracks and the notorious Ica stones, which supposedly depict dinosaurs, that there were always people in pre Columbian America painting pictures of them. Well, that was done, but not back in the pre Columbian times. It's done modern, and they're just recent constructions. Um, and so you you can use um, uh, all of those measurements as a way of uh, delineating uh, where people are going astray. You can have a, the Ica stone to be an example of what I would call a litmus test. It's something that if somebody thinks they're legitimate, whoa, you immediately have a problem with that person's approach. Uh, the other thing is um, from a source methods direction, when you're debating and interacting with creationists or with anybody on any topic, try to find out where they're getting their information from. And if they're really reluctant to say, even when multiply prodded, that's um, a giveaway that they are a bottom feeder and a lazy one. Now, you get into the mid-range parasites uh, in a lot of areas, in some areas more directly than others. When, uh, in, when I'm interacting with people online uh, on creationism versus climate science denial, um, the climate science denier is much more likely to be lobbing technical papers. But of course, we would have to wonder where are they getting their technical information from? And it's probably copying stuff off of a climate science website, the denier website, and that they're lobbying those at you as techno geeks. That, that happens among creationists as well, where they will have gotten material from their secondary source font and they're throwing that at you. Functionally, that's what Standing for Truth does um, in his uh, material. He's simply scavenging through what Sanford says on his website and repeating those points. Um, anybody who's doing the authority quotes, um, Salvador uh, uh, Cordova, uh, that um, uh, Dapper Dino just had a really interesting discussion with on the notion of fitness just a little bit ago. Um, it was not an acrimonious discussion, which is why it was so congenial. Uh, but nonetheless, it revealed that the uh, whole fitness issue that was the topic of the debate hadn't really been thought through very well at example level other than the arguments that were being presented by Sanford and others relating to fitness. So it, he's still operating as basically a conduit for somebody else's opinion. And um, when you really get into inventive minds, um, they know their limits of their own era. When I'm following um, Nick Zentner, the geologist, who is just doing a gang busters, Eastern Washington, or, or uh, Central Washington University there, uh, in uh, Ellensburg, 
uh, series on the various um, exotic terrains, the fruitcake he calls them, that underlie uh, the big Columbia basalt, uh, the German chocolate cake, as he calls it. He loves analogies of things. And, and we're literally following his exploration of the geology, areas that he was not aware of when he started the series. So he is literally showing his exploratory method um, as a professional geologist, but he readily will inform uh, the, the viewers that there are things that, oh, he doesn't know about this particular area, or this is a rock form he's not familiar with, or this is a piece of real estate, the geology area that he's never been to, and so this is all new material, or new science writers that he's not familiar with their work before. Uh, and he'll gauge how impressed he uh, looks with it, but he always bears in mind that penumbra of, of the new thing he's researching. And it illustrates very beautifully how the actual method runs. And they're, they're immensely informative. Well, that, that is the same procedure that everybody should be using. Know what you know and what you only suspect, or worse, the things that you'd like to have true, but maybe you don't actually have the evidence to support them. And then think through carefully with the active goal to incorporate as much of the data field as you possibly can. And be familiar with the various people that have written on the subject. Uh, pro and con, up and down. I have a sense of the history of the discussion. In some cases, when, when, uh, I, my big deal that I've been looking at for decades is um, uh, the creation evolution issue. So I have a focus on how anti-evolutionism has been conducted in way bygone times, back in the 19th century, long before even I was around, but also within my own lifetime in the 60s, 70s, and 80s, and then you get the new crop of people that are doing YouTubes that may be 20, 30 years old. Well, that means they're basically operating in a window of experience that's only the last 15 years or so, maybe. So they may be unaware of how arguments went a long, long time ago. Some of them may or may not be aware of Wayne Ish uh, in creationism. He's not widely discussed today. Uh, Gish is dead. He's been dead for years. Uh, the books he wrote, the last ones he wrote were in the 1990s. Uh, that's a long time ago. And so they kind of filter back, even though an awful lot of the views of Gish have been percolating through, in addition to the infamous Gish Gallop, which is was named for him, for his capacity to just pick up on an argument and barrage factoids at you. Um, Kent Hovian, to some extent, does the same kind of thing, and, and there are a lot of ones that operate in that same mode of barrage with. And the point is, is that it's called a gallop because you don't have time to respond to the, every single one of those. And if a, a skilled gish galloper can present 15 false things in 20 minutes, and it's going to take you hours and hours and hours to track down why each one of those is claptrap. That's a labor-intensive thing. That's why, in some respects, the more you become familiar with the prior apologetics, um, the easier it is to deal with things on the fly. Because if somebody in a video has glommed on to a factoid that they got from somebody who was copying something that ultimately traces back to Blaine Gish, if you already know that backstory, you're ready to pounce. Oh, you're repeating that one. Um, there are a relatively limited number of tropes that get put around in any apologetic deal. This is a universal, it doesn't matter what they're talking about, whether you're dealing with um, people who doubt Shakespeare or wrote Shakespeare's plays or creationism. Uh, anybody that's watched standard videos knows that there, it, it boils down to certain popular things. And if you're looking at somebody running from a young earth creationist frame versus somebody from an intelligent design point of view, they'll often and cherry pick tropes from their apologetic frames, and those may or may not intersect. Some quotes will pop up um, in just about everybody. You get a lot of Stephen Jay Gould, for example. Um, if they're uh, making the deep big deal about the religion angle, as though evolution were pro against or anti religion, um, Richard Dawkins comes up as a lightning rod. You find the same thing amongst um, climate science deniers where they, they seem to think all they need to do is to wave Al Gore and say, oh, you're following old Al Gore. No, I'm not. I don't care what Al Gore is perfectly fine if he does videos and 
appears on television shows, but all of the science data I'm drawing on, do. none of them are by Al Gore. So I don't need to bother about him. So knowing that playing field is really quite relevant. Also, um, just enjoy it as fun. It's um, a delightful exercise. Um, in all the debates I've tried to do, I've come at it for, with the idea that I want to educate those watching the show. I'm not there to persuade the person I'm debating that they're wrong because they're probably a Tortugan and they're not going to change their mind. So um, uh, the, the most you're going to be having is to, to put information on the field that anybody watching that debate later is going to be able to build on. And they're going to maybe think, gee, I should probably look into this a little more and maybe start fact checking more. And if that is what they start doing, then, well, zingy zing, that's great, because that's precisely the whole point of the source method. thing. So um, at this point, I would have been glancing over to the chat that I can't see to find out if anybody's making any comments or if anybody's there at all. And the fact that I can't do that is pissing me off. Uh, so what I'm going to do, we're at uh, 739. We've gone most of the way through an hour. Uh, I've got um, unsure whether or not it might have glitched up. So if the opening part of the show ended up as a separate stream or not, I'll just eventually delete that. Not even bother about it. Um, but it'll get the main bulk of it across. And and then uh, once it's posted, which typically for restream takes you know about a day, uh, I get a little notice on it. Uh, I'll then update and put in all the links about the material that I've done to reprise. Uh, the Madagascar Biogeography and uh, Nutball Brian Ford's Aquatic Dinosaur Theory uh, and Sidelights. And so um, we'll see where we're going on next week's material. Um, at least we've got the thing. I, I had a panic attack uh, a bit ago because the computer wouldn't start up the laptop. And the little drive was humming and humming and humming. So something was just stuck uh, inside the machine. It eventually drained the whole power down. And I thought, wait a minute. Uh, I, I um, thought, let's actually let it go drain all the way down. So um, once it got completely dead as a doornail, uh, then I plugged the thing back into recharge and it rebooted. So it like it sort of went yagda, 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 and rebegan in that. So I suspect things like that will happen all the time. I'm sure everybody has their own little foibles on things. Uh, I, I, uh, even though I started up fairly early because of the length of time it takes Restream to, to sync up on the um, uh, internet connection that I have, uh, it was still the point where I was just barely getting started by 7 o'clock. So um, these things are, are wacky. And um, I'll, I'll, I will then shut down the uh, show, and then I will try to hunt up what the hell is the problem with the chat enabling and, and see what happens on that. So uh, thank you very much for anybody that's out there that's actually watching. Uh, this is a shortened but longer than last episode uh, example of the program. Um, everybody stay safe in the COVID thing. We're facing a really serious time now where um, you can get the virus spreading so quickly that it's going to completely overwhelm hospital beds. And all of that's not good. So everybody hunker down, stay safe, wear a mask, keep social distancing. Uh, let the wackaloons run around and do bad things and catch the diseases and, and drop dead. Um, not that anyone should, but nonetheless, if they're going to imperil them, don't let them imperil your life. And um, um, make it through here until the next year, and we will see what all happens. So, a uh, few more episodes this month, um, depending upon if I'm here at home or on the fly. Theoretically, we can conduct evolution hours from anywhere I take the laptop. I've got a good internet. And we'll find out how well that goes. So we are finishing the show for today. And uh, see you all next week-ish.